I became aware of her because I grew up in the 50s and I, that was a period when she was on The Ed Sullivan Show all the time. And the wonderful thing about opera in the US in the 50s was because opera singers uh, appeared frequently on shows like Ed Sullivan, Voice of Firestone, Bell Telephone, people who didn't know anything at all about opera knew who they were. My parents knew nothing about opera, but they could probably identify 12 stars of the Met because they saw them on the Ed Sullivan Show. So that was the first I saw her was on the Ed Sullivan Show. And I clearly remember my mother and my grandmother, who lived with us at the time, having a heated argument about whether her name was pronounced Risa or Rise. She has been on the board of the, of the Metropolitan Opera Guild um, since the early 1970s, and I joined the staff in 1976. And um, I knew that she was on the board from board lists, but I was amazed to see that how active she was as a board member, that she came to committee meetings. Um, I had at one point, I ran the membership program, and she was on the membership committee. And she would come to the meetings and participate in a way that I thought was uh, beyond what I expected of her. And the other thing I learned very quickly about her after getting to know her was that when I would address the entire board, um, it's not such an easy thing to do. There are 45 people on the board, and they can be a kind of starchy group. So if you're standing up giving a presentation to the entire board, um, it can be difficult. But I, was, I would always seek her out. I would look for her face because she would be sitting and beaming at me. Um, and that's the kind of warm, encouraging person she's been for the, for the 35 years that I've known her. Until I started working, actually working on material for presentations to honor her, um, it was always recordings. It was her Carmen recording. It was her uh, popular music recordings, because she made quite a few of them, as all those stars did. Um, and she was very, very good at it, as the best American stars were. She could sing Cole Porter, and she could sing Jerome Kern, and, and, and sang them as beautifully as she sang Carmen or Dalila. And that's how I got to know. Well, you know, that's, I, I, that's hard for me to say because I haven't seen all the Carmens. It's also like comp trying to compare her. I do think she was a wonderful actress, and I've seen the footage of her performing Carmen in the Guthrie production. And this is a case where she had completely restudied the role. Uh, she had been a famous Carmen from the 40s on, but in 1951, when, when she started doing it with Guthrie, she completely restudied the role and, and reconceived the role with Jerome Guthrie. And he was a brilliant director. If you look at the footage, you can see that he's given them all a very, very specific business, which even today works. And she was a brilliant Carmen. It's hard to compare her to the other famous Carmens who came before her because there's, there's not enough documentation. Uh, Geraldine Farrar was a famous Carmen. And you can hear her on recordings, and you can see photographs. But there's really not that much. Emma Calve sang Carmen more than anyone else at the Met. Uh, she, I think her record beats Reese's by about 12 performances. Uh, but you know, there again, you hear very, very old recordings, and you see photos. And you also realize that, that performance styles were different then. Acting styles were different. It's like comparing Edmund Keane to Laurence Olivier. You, know, you don't really know what those people were, but you assume from whatever exists that the style was different. It was much bigger. It was much less subtle. Uh, Risa's Carmen was very varied. Uh, she, in, if you look at the 10 minutes or so of the final scene, you see many, many different aspects of the character within one scene. Uh, she was very glamorous, but you could also see that she was just a little bit trashy. Um, she, uh, uh, she was very proud. You saw that she adored Escamillo. She, you saw her total disdain for Don Jose. And most of all, you saw the incredible terror uh, because of the way that they shot that, uh, that they staged that scene where she was literally trapped. It was staged in Escamillo's dressing room as opposed to the arena. And she was literally trapped by this crazy person with a knife. And she seems genuinely terrified. Even with Richard Tucker. She says she was genu genuinely terrified when she did it with Mario Delmonico, um, whom she didn't trust with a real knife. <laughs> but even with Richard Tucker, she was, she was terrified. And you can see that. 
I think it's because number one, the way she looked and and her 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 carriage, and you know, she was glamorous. She was very beautiful. She was also very warm. She's personally warm, and and that carried over into her performances. Uh, but because she did so much television, because she did Ed Sullivan so much, and other shows like that, people got to know her. And she happened to be the one mezzo at that time who was really doing that. There were lots of other sopranos like Roberta Peters and Dorothy Kirsten and other very beautiful ladies um, who were starting to redefine the way people thought of opera singers. They weren't heavy. Um, they were quite beautiful. They looked not unlike the people who were popular in television who weren't opera singers. Um, Roberta Peters didn't look so unlike Donna Reed <laughs> that people couldn't identify with her. Um, but Risa was the only mezzo who got to do that. And I think that's why by the time Bing came to the Met, she was um, the only mezzo who got, who got the leading fee, who got the top fee. That's, I, th I find it very hard to talk about voices because people end up using the same kind of trite words and it's hard to find new words. I find her voice very, very warm. Um, she had terrific technical ability. She, had, uh, she was wonderful with the languages she sang in, uh, German, Italian, French. She was fluent in those languages. Um, she had a wonderful range. Uh, it was very even voice from top to bottom. You don't hear register breaks at all. Other than that, it's very difficult to, for me to talk about a voice. I th well, first of all, she cares about people. I think the things that she did most often as an administ administ administrator was talking, working with artists, working with young artists. She's always cared about young artists. Um, when she was running the national company, I think that's the thing she cared about the most, was she was bringing up a group of young artists. When she was running the National Council auditions, she was certainly involved with the young artists. And that's what she was best at, giving advice, listening to their problems, um, helping them along and caring about them. She is someone who, uh, when you say hello to her on the phone, the first thing she'll say is, how are you doing? And she really listens to the answer. She cares about that. Um, uh, she's a very intelligent person. Uh, she has a good mind for details. Um, so while I never worked for her as an administrator, I could tell from the kinds of questions she would ask um, that she would know how things ran. Um, she had enough experience running the national company, working with the, uh, working with the uh, national council auditions, that she understood how things should run. You know, I don't know that that's really what happened, that he wouldn't let her sing it. I think probably what was happening was he had a whole roster of people to take care of and he had a whole season to cast. And from my reading of that situation, he cast someone else as Orfeo. And I'm sure that Walter and other representatives might not have been happy about that, but he had Risa doing other things. Uh, Simeonato dropped out and then he asked Risa. Um, and no, she never talks about it, but she wouldn't. She's not somebody who would ever hold a 50-year grudge for one thing. <laughs> and my guess is she doesn't even remember. She remembers Orfeo. It's her favorite role. If you ask her what her favorite role is, she'll, she won't say Carmen. She'll say Orfeo. She loved doing it in Greece. She loved making the recordings, and she loved doing it at the net. No, that's the thing that's harder for her to say. I think, it's, I think if you were to ask her that, she'd say, I love the music. The music is so beautiful, and I love the character. And I love, you know, she's interested in the myth. But that would be as much as, as you could probably get from her. No, because there's probably only one. You know, she was a great carabino, but Mozart, you know, remember she made her debut in 1938, and Mozart didn't have the, uh, the place in the repertoire in 1938, and even through the 40s, Figaro came back in the 40s, so she was able to do Carabino, but um, she didn't do Don Giovanni, she didn't do that much Mozart, and the Met didn't do Mozart operas that we do now, like Idomeneo and Clemenza de Tito, just weren't in the repertory until much later. So um, she was wonderful as Carabino, but I don't know that you'd call her a Mozartian. 
she, I think she's meant a lot to the Met because she's played so many different roles there. You know, she was a star. She became an administrator. She was a board member of the Met for many years uh, and still is. She's a board member of the Guild still for many years. Uh, remember, she played a very important role before that even in 1961 when she helped the Met avert a strike. She literally contacted President Kennedy and said, this cannot happen. They can't cancel the season. And he passed her on to Arthur Goldberg, who was the uh, Secretary of Labor, and she brought. She was the one who went down to Washington to talk to Goldberg, and um, and helped the Metaverse to strike. And this is someone who had just given up singing uh, within a year, uh, but she was the one who cared about it so much and and was forceful and knew how to do it. She was a wonderful fundraiser. She could talk anybody into giving money. Uh, that was one of the best things she did at the National Company, was keep it going financially by getting people to give donations. She was definitely one of the people who helped popularize opera in this country because uh, she was such a wonderful, warm, caring personality. Uh, she was the kind of person you would like to meet. Uh, she was a wonderful spokesperson for the Met. I remember her going on television and uh, some of the telecasts and speaking directly to the camera. Um, and she was, uh, in many ways, she was a precursor to Beverly Sills in the way that uh, she could be a regular person, uh, glamorous but still warm and a, a real person um, who helped people understand that opera was for everyone, that you didn't have to have um, you didn't have, have to have wealth to enjoy opera. You didn't have to have an enormous education to enjoy opera. Um, you could, uh, anyone could enjoy opera. And I think she had an impact that way. Walter used to talk her, her husband Walter used to talk her into doing things that she didn't necessarily want to do. Um, Walter was a very funny, uh, interesting, smart person. Um, one of the first managers um, who really understood how to make an opera star popular. In uh, tandem with Walter uh, was a wonderful publicist named Edgar Vincent, who just died a couple of years ago, who handled Beverly Sills and Placido Domingo and Risa and, and um, many, many other clients. And uh, they worked together very closely into making Risa as big a name as possible. She kind of left that to them. But then they would ask her to do things that she didn't necessarily want to do. And at one point they asked her to roller skate on the Ed Sullivan Show. And while she was athletic, she was a tomboy, she still uh, wasn't very comfortable roller skating. And you can see the footage of her singing Let It Snow in a very pretty winter outfit, pretending to ice skate on roller skates, but on the arms of a male roller skater who um, held her firmly in check. And a couple of times she nearly falls, and at one time she screws up her lyrics. It was very specific. Uh, that's something that opera singers very often have trouble understanding. Um, they don't have the same um, training in acting that an actor would have, and they don't understand necessarily. Usually when you see people acting in opera, it's very generalized. It's, oh, I'm happy, oh, I'm unhappy, I'm distraught, and then there are levels of, of being unhappy. But with, with Risa, and as Carmen at least, it was very, very specific. Uh, you knew that she had been working with, an, uh, with a director who understood that. Um, and she had very specific business, and you knew exactly what she was thinking at every moment. Uh, it's what they say about good film acting, that a good film actor lets all of those emotions, you can read his or her mind. And that's the way Reese's performance was as Carmen, and that's why it's so startling. Um, that and that terror that palpable terror that she has when she's, in the very last moments, uh, she's being threatened by Don Jose, this, this madman with a knife, and has no way to escape, and tries to get around a table, um, he, he can't get behind the table, gets trapped um, against the wall where he finally does kill her, and then has this wonderful, very theatrical moment where she uh, tries to scream for help at a window grabs the curtain, can't scream for help, and then falls, and then they had the curtain come off the rod link by link. So she was left lying on the floor with this curtain as a kind of shroud. There are two versions. There was a version shot in the Met. They were actually both shot in the Met, 
But the Met was doing um, those closed circuit television things at that time. They did maybe one a year. And they did one at the Carbon maybe a few weeks after the production premiered. And that was really, it's the, lo the only thing that exists is Act Four. All of Act Four exists. And there you can see the whole thing. And you can see uh, the chorus actually makes an entrance at the end, which doesn't usually happen at Carmen. But people come into this dressing room because they've heard screaming. And they're, they're standing there staring at the scene of her dead on the floor. That you don't see on the Sullivan version. The Sullivan version, however, um, is much better shot. It's on a, an approximation of the, of the set. And uh, much, uh, they had more than one camera, and they had close-ups, and you can really see uh, what's going on. Richard Tucker is wonderful in it, too. He's really, he wasn't known as an actor, but he was an actor under Guthrie. And he was, uh, he's a very convincing, don't you say? She told me once, you know, she was very, very good at understanding what she should and should not do as an opera singer, what role she should sing. And I think that's one of the reasons she kept her voice in sub such good shape. And she told me a wonderful story about being invited by Lotta Lehman to spend some time for her and Walter to go and spend a weekend um, at Lotta Lehman's house. And they got there, they were in California at the time, they got there to find that the other guests were Bruno Walter and Thomas Mann. But they also found out within the first hour that, there, that both Lehman and Bruno Walter had a plan in mind. And the plan was to convince her to sing Fidelia, to sing Leonora and Fidelia. And they sat her down with Walter on the piano to say, we're going to teach you, I'm going to teach you this role. And of course, Lehman was a very, very famous Leonora. And Risa was appalled because she knew that was not a role for her. And basically, they argued about it for some time. And they kept saying, no, you must do it. You must do it. And she kept saying, I should not do it. I can't do it. And eventually, they walked out and left. <laughs> I'm sure she met him when she was in Europe before she made her Met debut, uh, because she would, like many other singers, she had to go to Europe. Um, to uh, there was there was no way that a young American singer could learn and really progress in the United States at that time. So she made a name for herself in Europe, um, and then came back when the war looked like it was going to happen. And that's how she met Walter, who was Hungarian, and they met in Vienna, um, and that's how uh, they met each other. <laughs> what words do I use? <laughs> they uh, fell in love um, in Europe and were together for some time. And then she realized she really should leave um, because war was about to start. And she left. And um, they corresponded from time to time. But I think she felt that, well, that was a wonderful adventure. It was a wonderful romance, but it's over now. And there was also a period when she didn't hear from him. And she um, became engaged to someone else. She met someone else and became engaged to him. And she wrote a letter telling Walter that she had become engaged to another man. And he got over here by boat somehow and arrived on, at her door. She was living with her parents, arrived at her door on a very rainy night, soaked through, and said, you're not marrying him, you're marrying me. And they did. When Risa was in, in Russia doing the Ed Sullivan show, and I think she did some other things there because the State Department was involved, and this was the early 60s, she and Walter and Nicky went over there. He was probably eight or nine and had a great adventure going to Moscow. Um, and in the, they were convinced that their room was bugged, um, their hotel room was bugged. And one day, Walter and Risa were in the room having a conversation, and, and she said something like, Walter, we have no more soap. We've run out of soap. So he said, well, let me go and, and see if I can get some. So he went down the hallway, and he went to the concierge, who was you know, in Russian hotels. I don't know about now, but in those days, they would have a woman sitting there behind a desk um, to uh, take care of things for you. And he went, he approached the woman at the desk and said, and was about to say, we need more soap. And he didn't open his mouth, and she reached into a drawer and gave him a bar of soap. <laughs> Well, 
Well, at that time, you know, there were State Department things that went to Russia really from the 50s on. Remember the Borgi and Bess um, uh, tour uh, that Truman Capote wrote about. And, um, but I, think, I still think it was unusual. You know, Van Cliburn had a lot to do with that, winning the Tchaikovsky competition, and it opened up things a little bit. But, um, and I'm not sure how Ed Sullivan got to produce this program, but it was a very unusual thing of Ed Sullivan producing a program uh, from Moscow. Um, it was all filmed, it wasn't live the way the Ed Sullivan show normally was. But I've seen footage of her singing Getting to Know You in Russian, um, walking through the parks of Moscow, obviously very staged um, and lip-synced, but, um, but it's, it's charming footage.